Welcome to Breakpoint This Week. I'm Shane Morris, and I'm here with John Stone Street to talk about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. John, last week we talked about uh, the Supreme Court, and you said that that there was a lot more coming, a lot more big decisions coming down the pike uh, before our next program. And uh, boy, that certainly turned out to be the case. We did. Two it happened. Two big decisions that have just changed the, the landscape of uh, religious liberty and the abortion issue for uh, Christians moving forward. Yeah, it really did. I mean, we started out with a, a decision uh, having to do with abortion and went on uh, with a decision specifically dealing with Christian institutions. Uh, we could say one good, one bad, uh, but there's also a lot of undercurrent here in terms of what kind of court we have, which is a really important, I think, thing to, to nail down given the kind of hysterical uh, worry, particularly from those on the left, particularly those who are uh, pro-abortion forces about you know, the threat of this court in particular overturning Roe v. Wade. And I, I think the, you know, the first takedown or the first takeaway, I guess, maybe better word than takedown. Uh, the first takeaway is essentially that this court is not going to be the one that overturns Roe v. Wade. And what we had instead was a, a decision uh, not only with, uh, you know, so one of the medical uh, services uh, versus uh, Rousseau and uh, you're talking about, right? Yeah, the June Medical Services versus Rousseau, which is, had to do, we, 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 let's lay the groundwork, it had to do with the Louisiana law, which in many ways was patterned after a Texas law that the court had struck down, uh, I think in 2016, uh, which basically required abortion providers, uh, abortionists, to have uh, hospital admitting privileges within 30 miles of where they were performing abortions. And uh, in Texas, Which is standard of course, for surgery centers, is that right? Oh, it's standard, I think, for uh, LASIK surgery center. I mean, it's oh, not wow. just, okay. yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a pretty standard thing. Uh, in Texas, of course, what it would have done was close uh, a, the vast amount of abortion clinics and also, uh, I, I think, remove abortion services for the vast amount of women. It was a very similar, similarly worded uh, uh, law in Louisiana uh, that uh, initially, I think the, the, the first court it went to struck down, the next court actually upheld, mm. and then it went to the Supreme Court. And th there were two things here that, are, that, that, that I think were, uh, were troubling. The first one had to do specifically with this law and this approach to providing some sort of regulation over abortion providers. And look, as we saw in the Kermit Gosnell case, which is the Philadelphia abortionist um, uh, in which th that wasn't regulated for 30 years, 30 years, uh, uh, it, it basically went without oversight to the point that not only did a woman lose her life uh, uh, because of a Kermit Gosnell botching an abortion and and his staff, some of whom had no medical licenses doing things like administering anesthesia, but, but turned into what, when authorities finally did go in there and police went in there, they, they described it as a house of horrors. House and of horrors. you can read that, oh, it was unbelievable. And, and this is, John, the point you're making here is fantastic. It's, it's exactly what these kinds of regulations are meant to prevent. And they're not unreasonable regulations. I mean, even setting aside the issue of pro-life versus pro-choice, it is not unreasonable to require um, those working in a surgical center, which abortions are surgical, uh, to have admitting privileges to a hospital, the same as other surgical centers. This is a very basic ground level sort of medical regulation. And yet this was struck down as an undue burden on the right uh, of abortion, which itself is, as uh, I think it was uh, Clarence Thomas said in his dissent from this decision, it, it is a right that the Supreme Court has invented and, and found in the Constitution where it doesn't really exist and now is hedging around with so many absurdly uh, excessive protections that it, it amounts to a prohibition on any reasonable restrictions on this so-called right. Well, and I'll, I want to get to that because that's the, that's the second, uh, which has to do with the overall uh, conversation about abortion in America, but just on the ground having to do with this specific law and this specific attempt at a regulation, mm. th 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 it was really troubling because the, the court seemed to ignore the fact that the situation on the ground in Louisiana was sufficiently different than the situation on the ground in Texas, even in terms of limiting a woman's access uh, to abortion services. And the court seemed to completely overlook that, which to me is, is troubling on two fronts. Number one is it is treating abortion as if it's not a surgical procedure, as if it's not something that has inherent risk and dangers. Like I said, I mean, 
hospital admitting privileges are required for LASIK. If you want to talk about people who have, you know, whose lives have been at risk uh, between having an abortion or having LASIK surgery, I mean, look, look, because that was a talking point for the left is that abortion is this, you know, very safe procedure. But it also has huge implications, Shane, of, of something that we have said over and over and over, which is that this real conversation needs to happen on the ground in local communities. This is why pregnancy resource centers in every town in America virtually are such a strategic uh, way of advancing uh, an ethic of, of life because you have to deal with women on the ground in their particular situations. Mm -hmm. And the court ignored that difference and, and again, elevated this or escalated this, which many people think is one of the fundamental flaws of Roe v. Wade to begin with, mm -hmm. is that it took away the state's rights in determining, uh, you know, uh, well, yeah, I mean, this jeopardizes pretty much all state level abortion restrictions, no matter what. Uh, I think Rod Dreher called it a, the abortion forever decision. He said that the court is is signaling here that at least under um, Chief Justice Roberts, they're not going to be interested in, in striking down or reversing uh, Roe v. Wade. Not if this doesn't pass the test. Right. And how Neil Gorsuch ruled in the Bostock decision mm -hmm. uh, was very similar in terms of the language that Justice Roberts used. But, but, but in, in the, um, the majority opinion in this case, uh, which again, uh, found that the Louisiana law was unconstitutional, the groundwork that was laid uh, by uh, Justice Breyer was that, that this, you know, basically could be considered an undue burden. Mm -hmm. If a woman's safety is not a legitimate consideration in an abortion procedure and is is instead reinterpreted to mean that it's an undue restriction. And let's, let's remember, too, this whole concept of undue restriction uh, was completely invented out of midair as well, right? Not only the right to an abortion, but the right, th th this idea that comes out of Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, that, that that not only does abortion need to be legal, but we have to remove any and all obstacles at any level that you know basically mm -hmm. constitutes an undue burden. That is a, a a legal tunnel wide enough to drive a Mack truck through, right? I mean, in other words, any what does that include? That includes almost everything. Is it, it going to include, for example, in the future, you know, financial burdens a, a, as a way to justify uh, giving even more of our tax dollars to abortion? you know, yeah. procedures, despite the accounting gymnastics that Planned Parenthood clinics already do uh, in order to navigate th that law. But, but then there was also this um, appeal to, uh, by, by Chief Justice John Roberts, and we can't miss the fact that he was in the dissent in the Texas decision. In other words, mm -hmm. he thought the Texas law should have stood. But since and, then, apparently the judicial precedent has grown to a sufficient place where he thinks that you can desari decisis uh, how do you say that i i am ashamed starry of decisis so starry starry decisis, decisis is yes, yes. basically yeah it's this appeal to precedent i took latin i should know this what am i doing <laughs> you were a homeschooler you should right. know this um look that was what was really troubling because i think and many people think that what it did is betray what kind of chief justice we have and that mm -hmm. is a chief justice that right now is very concerned with the legacy of the court and very concerned with the reputation of the court yeah. and that the court itself has to be seen as this kind of flawless arbiter between the other uh, you know, uh, constitutional exec uh, branches of government, the executive mm -hmm. and the legislative branch. And, 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 and there's a real concern here of the optics that this is you know, Trump's court. And um, as opposed, and it seemed to me like, it, you know, I can't read Justice Chief Justice Ro John Roberts' mind, but if I were, it would seem that that was as much a statement on no, we are a legitimate court, we are the legitimate arbiter, uh, arbiter of, of these sorts of things, and it ignored the fact, for for example, that Chief Justice Roberts himself had written opinions that overturned uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that has uh, have overturned precedent, and that the court has overturned precedent three hundred times. Yeah. And does anyone looking back at, for example, um, uh, the Dred Scott decision or other <laughs> decisions that the court has not only gotten wrong, but has gotten dreadfully wrong, right? right, right. And especially in, in ones like Roe v. Wade, which basically dehumanizes an entire segment of the American population, that those things aren't worthy of overturning. Uh, um, look, we, we, we all would say the Dred Scott decision was awful and it needed to be overturned. And it wasn't. It was overturned, by the way, by the Civil War mm -hmm. and the 13th Amendment. Um, but uh, 
listen, the court has overturned precedent 300 times uh, in its history is kind of the rough number uh, as, as I understand it. Uh, th this is a, uh, uh, it, it was an appeal not to uh, the merits of this particular Louisiana law, but it was, a, it, was a, it was an appeal to the court's reputation. And man, that is, a, uh, that is not the basis upon which the yeah. court should operate. We've got to go to a break here in a second, but, but before we do, John, I want to note that the, the elephant in the room here is really that um, this is such a big blow because it was the decisive vote was cast by a Republican appointee, um, John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. And I remember back when uh, he was appointed by, or rather nominated by George W. Bush, um, the same as when Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh were nominated by President Trump, there was this um, general feeling in the pro-life movement that, okay, here's our chance. We finally got, you know, we've got a better number on the court now. We're going to be able to, uh, did he replace Rehnquist? Is, or, or, um, yeah, it's a great, that's a great he question. So, so I don't, yeah, he, maybe he replaced a conservative justice. I'm forgetting. I have to look back at my uh, recent history here. But the general feeling was that this guy's going to be really solid and pro-life and he's going to help in the, the effort to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now that, you know, that tastes like sawdust in our mouths now. And, it, and I think there are legitimate questions we need to ask now about um, what, is it, what is our strategy as the pro-life movement look like going forward? And is it going to be as centered on the Supreme Court as it has been uh, until now? Well, yeah, and, and this is a legitimate question, um, and it's something that we've got to wrestle with, especially since I think it's something like 13 of the last 18 mm -hmm. Supreme Court justices have been nominated by uh, uh, conservatives, by, by Republicans, and, and we certainly haven't always gotten the results that we want to ha have gotten. Mm -hmm. it, it's, still, it's still true. Two things are still true. Number one is, is that the pro-life movement has made its greatest impact thinking that the court was against it and mobilizing volunteers, mobilizing pregnancy resource centers, mobilizing pro-life apologists. And, and that's why we've seen the movement that we have seen in the issue of abortion. Uh, and and, and, and that, that, that strategy is now demonstrated once again to be irreplaceable. We, mm -hmm. you know, the Supreme Court is going to be the cherry on the top of the Sunday. It's not going to be the Sunday uh, when it comes to any sort of advances that we, we make here. And, and, and look, it, it does... It is still true uh, that uh, you know what uh, that Elena Kagan and um, Sonia Sotomayor are far worse, right? In other words, it, it's not, and that uh, you know a, a, a completely revisionist uh, court appointee is is going to make uh, even worse decisions, and they're going to justify it. And this is this is huge too that they're going to justify it with legal gymnastics that we don't want to be established as precedent now that we have all learned from Chief Justice John Roberts how important precedent is. Yeah. We'll be right back after this, folks. We're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. We're back on Breakpoint this week, talking about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. And John, the second Supreme Court case that came out this week and really changed the landscape on an issue that we talk about a lot here at the Colson Center, which is uh, religious freedom was good news. And it was really, really welcome good news after a very difficult um, uh, term with uh, decisions being handed down by the court. This was uh, Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. And the court ruled that a state tax credit, which uh, supposedly discriminates against religious schools and families whose children attend or hope to attend them, actually violates the First Amendment's free exercise clause. So the, it, it, it adds to a growing body of jurisprudence that says, in essence, if you're a religious institution, performing uh, a, a secularly valuable job of educating children, then it's acceptable for if you, if a state has decided to give state money to that institution via the students, so scholarship programs and the like, then it is not okay for the state to discriminate against religious institutions and say, no, 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 you can't go there. We can't have our money going to, going to there. The court says that's not a violation of the establishment clause of the first amendment, which is really good news for a lot of reasons. It, it is it is really good news, and I think there's a number of takeaways we can we can um, we we can uh, ascertain from this. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Shane, we got a question from a listener about the Bostock decision and what implications it had for religious institutions and pastors and so on. And what we have seen is that the the court, despite I think bumbling the Bostock decision and and certainly the um, uh, this Louisiana law decision. It, it has has pretty solidly laid out protections for uh, religious institutions, and that religious institutions can't be discriminated against solely because they are religious. And it has held that up over and over and over again. I guess we we could say 
that we should be somewhat slightly concerned that this was a 5-4 vote, uh, as opposed, right, if you yeah. remember, I mean, the, the, the references in this majority opinion in this Espinoza case to tr the Trinity Lutheran case, which also had to do with access and state funding uh, that was widely available, not being able to be uh, held withheld from religious institutions. If I remember right, I think the Trinity Lutheran was like a 7-2. So the 7-2 in these the Trinity Lutheran, if I'm right on those numbers, was a, a, was a, a pretty sweeping decision by a sweeping market margin, which was made it so unusual. And this obviously was a pretty narrow vote, 5-4. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it is important, and, and, and it does prove this. At the same time, th there's a lesson, th there's some lessons that are coming out of this complete term when you put all of these things together. And, um, you know, for example, there's conservative commentators that are saying, you know, it's not as bad as all that. The Bostock decision wasn't as bad as all that. You know, the Louisiana law, that wasn't as bad as all that. And, and what I have seen in this court in this term is this definition of religious liberty as if it stops at the door of religious institutions. Yes. And that's a real loss for religious liberty in the American context, because the American context has never been that which reserves religious freedom for people in the privacy of their own heads, their own homes, or their own houses of worship. It's been the ability of people to take their public convictions into the public square and into their public lives, including the world of commerce. Mm -hmm. And you know, lower courts have been very specific in trying to limit religious freedom in the world of commerce in particular. Yeah, that um, was why Jack Phillips' decision was to um, religious liberty, kind of what the Heller decision was to uh, the right to own a, a firearm because it was it said very clearly that no 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 your religious rights don't end when you walk out of the door of the church that you can take them into into your workplace with you and you don't have to now uh, create messages that violate your religious convictions. Well, you know, to be to be clear, what the court did in, in the Jack Phillips decision, it's it's a slight difference, and, and, and it, it was true. the That's state. True. I'm, probably, I'm probably overstating that because it was very procedural, wasn't it? Well, no, it, it, but it, but it did say that the state can't just look down upon you. And the, mm -hmm. the Jack Phillips case, it, the state can't look down upon you in your public life because you are a person of faith. Hmm. What's still to be decided in the Bostock decision, you know, really, I think, leaves in the future a Jack, the, the, the next Jack Phillips pretty exposed is that whether you can order your public life and, you know, how that um, uh, how that or, you know, orders what services you decide to provide and who you decide to provide it for. And, and it, you know, it did not protect his creative gifts quite like ADF had hoped it would and like the rest of us had hoped it would. Yeah. But at the same time, it, I, I just think it's, it, it, we can't underestimate the loss of relegating religious freedom just to people of faith and institutions of faith. Um, that's not what religious freedom has always been. That's not what religious freedom uh, ha has been in the American context that has, that, that has bolstered so many of other, other freedoms like freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. And that's what emerged in this Montana Espinoza versus Montana case is that the state of Montana was in a sense trying to, uh, you know, kind of play off uh, free exercise uh, against uh, uh, freedom of religion and basically said, no, 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 this is, the, you know, freedom of religion is not a, uh, a you know, the, the, the stepchild or, you know, the, the lesser of the First Amendment rights. You know, these are all things that have the same level of of, of protection. So it was a very good decision. A decision going the other way in this case would have been devastating uh, for uh, Christian institutions, especially educational ones. Yeah, this is good news, John, T to me, not just because um, the Supreme Court has handed, has thrown us a bone in an otherwise really cruddy term, but because it, it signals, I think, that that our ability to live other than at the mercy of the court as Christians is going to be uh, a viable option. So, you know, uh, Rod Dreher likes to talk about the Benedict Option and the idea that we have to um, reinforce our uh, our Christian institutions and way of life and, and get serious about preserving the faith from generation to generation beyond just engaging in politics. He's not calling for a withdrawal from politics. And obviously, I think the, the, right, <laughs> the, the right stance on most issues in my book is probably, okay, find out where Rod Dreher is and then move a little bit more in the optimistic direction. That's probably where, <laughs> that's probably where it is. But, but I, he's got a point that we need, to, um, we need to get really, really serious yesterday about carving out space, not just legally, but in terms of our institutions for preserving the faith in a time where it's fallen out of favor in uh, not only politically and, and legally, but in, in terms of culture, in the public eye. And Christian education is gonna be one of the most crucial ways that we do that. So anything that makes religious education easier on parents is uh, very good news. Right, and, and, and yeah, look, I, I think 
you know, Rod is, uh, is, is, is a brilliant guy and the prophetic nature of what he was recommending in the, in, in the Benedict option. And as I've argued, it, it, I don't think it's the kind of like hide away from the culture withdrawal that many right. people characterize it as, and neither would he. Um, and, and I think that we can't miss the pre-political part of his recommendations and really the, 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 the church's calling, which is, okay, now that we know we have these sorts of protections around religious institutions, let's strengthen these religious institutions. Mm -hmm. In other words, now the job is ours. Uh, the, the Supreme Court is not going to, you know, secure the discipleship of the next generation. Right. Uh, it's going to be the quality of those educational institutions, the quality of these uh, you know, uh, church structures of discipleship and other things. And we've got to get really serious about that. If we haven't uh, taken uh, in, into consideration the sort of world that, that we're moving into. And I, and I think a lot of people were able to kind of dismiss those recommendations from, from, um, from, from Rod and the Benedict option. And, and by the way, if, if folks, you don't know what we're talking about, uh, if you come to breakpoint.org, we'll link to a symposium that we did mm -hmm. wrestling with a, a book that Rod Dreher, a blogger at the American Conservative, wrote several years ago now uh, called The Benedict Option, in which he was saying, look, it's time to really strengthen our institutions and our uh, preparation for the culture. Um, and uh, I, I think people used a conservative uh, kind of landslide in the last, at least in the 2016 election, to justify not being serious about it. And, and, and I think that, uh, look, we're in, we're in that same presidential term. We're dealing with a court that's been largely uh, transformed because of the Supreme Court nominations. And, and Gorsuch okay. was on the right side of Espinosa, right? So, you know, as much as we criticized him, he, he landed on this protection. But again, uh, what it's done is, is it's given us ground to do the work that we need to do within our own institutions. We need to be quite serious about that. Yeah, and I think we also need to realize um, along with that, that there are three white buildings in Washington, D.C. that we cannot look to as Christians to give us um, victories culturally. We cannot look to those, those buildings to preserve um, our Christian heritage, our, our moral heritage, our freedoms uh, even. We have to rely on a broader strategy that engages the upstream culture that, that is expressed in those buildings most, most often. Um, and that's going to be the only way that we uh, really are able to preserve any of the heritage that we love so much in this country and, and even, um, God willing, move forward and actually uh, rebuild some of the freedoms and some of the heritage that we've lost in America. It sounds to me like you just snuck in a plug for your new podcast, which is called Upstream <laughs> with Shane Morris, which will be launched here in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely. You got me, John. Uh, we're well, listening to Breakpoint this week. We'll be right back after this break to talk more about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. Stay with us. We're back on Breakpoint this week, talking about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. And John, moving from the United States and the Supreme Court, which we've talked uh, enough about to, uh, up to this point, let's talk about the biggest international story, as far as I can tell, over the past week. And it is, um, I wish I could say otherwise, but it, it seems like really bad news. Uh, and it's, uh, it comes to us from Hong Kong, where we've, we've talked a lot about the developing situation there and the tensions with mainland China as the uh, terms of the 50-year handover agreement from Great Britain, uh, which is only uh, halfway done at this point, have been challenged again and again and again as China attempts to, uh, attempts to encroach on the freedoms that those in Hong Kong have both politically and religiously. So now uh, China has formally adopted a controversial new security law, giving it new powers over Hong Kong and deepening um, the fears that many there and, and around the world have for their freedoms. It's set to criminalize uh, secession, subversion, and collusion with foreign forces. And now let's just stop right there because that again falls into the category of a tunnel that's wide enough to <laughs> drive, enough a to Mack drive truck several Mack trucks and, through side by side. Right. Right. I mean, and, and people need to understand that what we count call subversion and almost always in the American context falls into the category of free speech. Right. You. Mm -hmm. This is one of the remarkable things that you're allowed to criticize the government here. You're allowed to criticize policy. You're allowed to do it harshly and even wrongly. Um, and, and yet what we have seen, these protesters who pre-COVID uh, went to the streets because of an extradition law that China was 
uh, passing, which would have allowed Chinese authorities to grab Hong Kong residents and citizens and, and send them to mainland for criminal trials. And that was worthy uh, of them thinking that this was a real threat to this one party or one country, two systems system that the Chinese government agreed to for 50 years. And we're not even halfway through the point right. there for that 50 year uh, journey. And now this law post COVID, and we are already seeing reports of how the Chinese government is using this to round up protesters, to do arrests, and, and uh, th there's a real fear now, and I think it's a very well-grounded fear uh, that this is the end of Hong Kong as we've known it, um, as a, you know, the economic freedom, the place of economic freedom, the place of, uh, of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the other freedoms that they've enjoyed, which has made it a very prosperous and um, flourishing, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what would you call it region, uh, and 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 now essentially all that's over. And you know the, the the key question here at the beginning was, will the world act? Will, will the world be outraged? Uh, will the world, especially Western corporations, put aside their own financial interests uh, for the good of the uh, of, of the people of Hong Kong? And Pre-COVID, it seemed like the answer was a resounding no. Post-COVID, with everyone distracted, um, you know, we're hearing so little about this, not only in the American press but around the world. Uh, this is a, uh, a tr this is a human rights tragedy. It is a, a moment in world history. Um, this is not good. Despite all the resistance that has marked the last year, John, I'll tell you what really struck me was reading about how as soon as this law passed, as soon as it was announced, um, several of the, pro, the leaders of these pro-democracy groups in Hong Kong immediately dropped all activity. And then the uh, UK government actually put out an offer for 3 million Hong Kong residents to apply for um, citizenship there in the United Kingdom. So it's, it seems like there's just this recognition on all sides of finality. It's like the extradition law was shot down, but now China has put something else in with teeth that will essentially enable them to shut down all pro-democracy and, and, and pro-religious liberty um, activities there. And it, it's really, really sad. And this is, you know, John, this is a worldview show. And reading the signs of the times in China, it looks like um, there's a winter descending there for Christians, not just in the mainland, but now in Hong Kong. Uh, political yeah. liberties also are, if not doomed, then significantly curtailed by this move. And this gives the Communist Party of China a essentially a blank check to prosecute opposition and um, de democracy movements there in Hong Kong. So moving forward, religious freedom watchdogs, I think, are going to be really crucial to um, watching the developing situation there in China. And then international pressure is going to become more important. And like you mentioned earlier, that's not just uh, political pressure. In many ways, I wonder if, uh, and this is wishful thinking, it's probably wishful thinking on my part, mm. but I'm an eternal optimist. In many ways, I wonder what would happen if a bunch of Western corporations that, um, sust that basically sustain China's economy through trade d said, we're not going to do business with you anymore until you cease this effort to gobble up Hong Kong and the religious liberty of and the political liberties of your uh, of your own residents. I don't know if that sort of thing could ever happen, but I think that would probably, if anything, have more impact on the Chinese government than political pressure from the United States, which they oftentimes seem to laugh off. Well, is it too much to ask that American corporations take Xi Jinping as seriously as they take Mark Zuckerberg? You know, I mean, it's 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 you know, we we saw that this week with you know pulling out of advertising dollars right, and right. I think what, what did I did I hear it cost Facebook like six billion dollars or something in advertising revenue just like that, and um, you know, of course, to, to Zuckerberg's point, he said, "Oh, they'll be back." Um, but with, the point is, with Xi Jinping, they haven't even left. And, and, and if Hong Kong then basically gets absorbed into the larger political culture of mainland China, we know what happens. We, we, we have seen uh, the church uh, in China being cracked down upon. We've seen Muslim Uyghurs by the thousands being relegated to re-education camps. We've seen, you know, uh, we, we told the story this week on, on one of our point commentaries of a, of a Chinese widow who had been receiving assistance from the government, the government came in her home, saw that she had you know, uh, Christian symbols on the wall and said, you know, your allegiance has to be to the government. She refused to take them down and they pulled uh, the, the, the sort of support that, that she has. 
but you know, even worse, we, we have seen in Hong Kong again, these leaders, and there is a religious underpinning to a lot of the Hong Kong protests and the, and, and the vision of, of culture and society that has dominated yeah, that's, the Hong that's Kong stuck experiment. With me since I saw them singing hymns as they, you know, in the Million Man March and so forth. Well, that's right. And, 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 it, and, and we, we talked about that on Breakpoint, and we'll link to a couple of those Breakpoint commentaries. If Again, if you come to breakpoint.org and you can read and get a, a little better idea of the religious underpinnings of what drove these protests in the beginning. And then what this means is, is that many of these folks are brothers and sisters in Christ. And just, you know, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the tragic and horrific situation that our uh, fellow believers are facing in Nigeria at the hands of Fulani herdsmen in Boko Haram. Um, and it, it also, I think, should drive us to a greater level of vigilance for religious freedom in America mm-hmm. uh, for, 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 two, um, for two reasons. We, we can't compare our plight, uh, even when we face, uh, you know, some level of kind of uh, disassociation with larger society because of religious freedom issues in America with the sort of persecution. But at the same time, it starts somewhere. And that erosion, then once it starts, happens fast. And the re- what we've seen around the world historically is that religious freedom is not just a freedom. It, there's a reason it's the first freedom. It, it secures so many of the other freedoms. And look, who are the loudest voices uh, pointing out the religious persecution that we see around the world? It's, 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 it's largely Westerners, especially Americans, uh, and who's going to advocate for these folks if we don't have the religious freedom in the United States to do so? Yeah, we need to stay in prayer for um, the people of Hong Kong, the people of China in, in general, especially our Christian brothers and sisters. And then um, John and I will keep covering it on this, uh, on this program as we see the situation developing. Well, you're listening to segment three of our online Breakpoint This Week program here. And John, this is, uh, we, we've got a, three different questions this week that I want to uh, get to. We may have to save one of them for next week. But the first question is uh, pretty straightforward. A reader says, I'm looking for any information regarding a biblical worldview on the death penalty. What should Christians think about the death penalty? Oh, it's such a hard question. It um, is. I, I will say that I don't buy the, um, the, the, the line that if you're pro-life and you want to protect the unborn, then you have to be against the death penalty as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the death penalty was instituted by God and even reinforced uh, after, uh, for example, in the Noahic Covenant. Uh, and it's, it's kind of the clearest statement that we have, uh, you know, the one who sheds blood, you know, should have his blood shed is, you know, right after uh, Noah gets off the ark, essentially. <laughs> um, and, and so it's, it, it's part of that. But, but, but the death penalty should only be reserved when it is the most pro-life thing to do. In other words, we're not answering the innocent taking of life. In other words, by not answering the innocent taking of life, then it becomes something that trivializes the value and dignity of life. Mm. At the same time, whether there should be a death penalty is one question. And how we've handled the death penalty is another question, right? Exactly. So you have whether right. philosophically it's justifiable, theologically it's, it's, it's uh, you know, included. And then also what's the process? Um, we have seen far too many people subjected to the death penalty and learn later that they're innocent or learn later that mm-hmm. there's more to the story. Uh, there's, this is a particularly nefarious thing when you're talking about uh, certainly death without the courts. And I'm thinking of lynchings in the South, uh, which is awful, which was used as a public spectacle, which was not a pro-life thing to do. It was actually used to further dehumanize and delegitimize the humanness of African Americans. Uh, that obviously is way off the table and just horrific and vile and obscene. Um, but but we also now have this sort of uh, technology that allows us to sometimes rethink cases that we thought were open and shut. And a lot of this too has to do with the larger context where just in the last 10 years or so, the justice system has started to realize that when when, when you're talking about a crime that's been committed, you're not just talking about two parties. You're not just talking about the perpetrator and the state as if the perpetrator sinned against the state. The perpetrator sinned against another citizen. And that means there's four parties that have to be considered in any criminal proceeding. That's the perpetrator, that's the victim, and uh, and that would include the victim's family and, and so on and the larger community where the trust has been broken and the state's job is to moderate and to ensure justice is done. Mm -hmm. That has proven to be a radical shift when we think about uh, 
you know, sentencing leg legislation, mandatory minimums, and all kinds of things. That should come into play here as well. Now, I will say this, Shane. Chuck Colson changed his mind on the death penalty yeah, back remember, and forth a couple times. I remember reading his article where he talks about his, his change of, of heart on that matter. Well, he changed more than once, as I remember it. And you're, you're right. In that one, it, it, but it had to do with, look, this is a, a nuclear option. You, you can't backtrack this. I mean, you put someone in prison unjustly for you know, a decade or two decades or even longer like we've seen, and there's at least some sort of restitution and honor that can be restored. It mm -hmm. certainly doesn't, you know, pay for the damage that's been done fully, but you don't have that with a death penalty. Um, you can't, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, once it's done, yeah. uh, it's done. And, and there's no way to backtrack on that. And, and that's where my concern comes from uh, on the death penalty. I will link to that uh, uh, Chuck Colson uh, article. If we can, <laughs> we have to dig it up. It's in the archives. We'll have to dig it up and, and see if we can do that on breakpoint.org. Uh, and that would be a great place to start to kind of wrestle through what the biblical worldview is. But when we talk about specifically the biblical worldview, then you look at what the text of scripture says, which seems to legitimize it. You look at the biblical teaching about image of God, about the dignity of every human life. And then yes, a biblical worldview does have space for the death penalty and it gives the state that sort of power. Uh, but listen, we should always be clamoring and fighting and advancing in our understanding that it's done justly and not unjustly. And we have a, a very, very shady track record as a nation about that. Mm -hmm. And John, we're both Protestant, but if I could speak for a second to the uh, Catholic position on this, more recently, the, the Catholic Church has, uh, has made a prudential judgment that the death penalty is inappropriate and called for uh, the end of it. And I forget whether that was during Pope John Paul II's tenure or mm -hmm. uh, before that. But the, the idea is not that the, that the Catholic Church has changed its mind on the death penalty, because obviously it, it supported it in the past for sometimes for crimes that um, that you and I yeah, would right, take yeah, it was issue unjust. with. Right, <laughs> for, yeah, exactly. for instance, being Protestant. Um, but uh, and to be fair, that was a two way street. But the the judgment that's been made is uh, is I think that it its modern implementation is so um, fraught and so unwise that there it uh, and that the value of um, a life continuing so that there's a chance of repentance, a chance of reconciliation, a chance of the gospel um, penetrating their heart, it, it outweighs the necessity for the death penalty. So it's not a condemnation per se on a moral basis. It's a, it's a prudential judgment. And I think it has to do with that, how it's carried out. Yeah. yeah and I think absolutely. it's legitimate as a Christian. I, I, I would support the death penalty very conditionally, but I think it's legitimate uh, as a Christian to look at the way it's implemented today and look at all the mistakes that are made and say, you know what? It's not. It's not just what's happening here. Is not what God intended when He brought down the covenant with um, Noah after the flood uh, that applies right. to all mankind. It, it, you know, and it also goes to in, in how we carry it out. Not just that sometimes we we have the wrong guy, and that's awful yeah. and tragic. But also, uh, you know, that it's so tied up with red tape. It's so tied up with court proceedings that you basically leave uh, people out uh, on, on death row for decades. Uh, and their families that are looking for justice when it is justified. And so th there's a lot of problems on both directions of this. But, you know, you can think, for example, of acts of terrorism, the masterminds of 9-11, for example, uh, when we know, when there's been an admission uh, of this and, and what sort of justice that the community needs in order to move on and to find healing and, and, and so on and to feel safe, uh, all of that stuff plays in here as well. Well, our next question is kind of a, it's kind of a statement, but it opens up into a question and I'll, and I'll just read it. It appears to me that the state has too much control over the church by forcing the wearing of masks and social distancing during the coronavirus uh, outbreak. Of course, I don't wear a mask and I don't intend to wear one in the church service. I think Christian, uh, or I think the Christian in me uh, will and should trust God, not allow the state to dictate how I must conduct myself in a church service. To be sure, most of what the state requires is not anti-Christian, but I think it's a matter of control. The Holy Spirit can still be in control when following uh, the directions of the state, but I also see it as a matter of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So when the state relinquishes the intrusion into my worship practices, I will return to active and personal attendance. Thoughts on that? That's a obviously yeah. a really hot issue right now. Well, it is. And I'm, I'm so glad the question was asked. I've been thinking about how to address this because I'm, I'm very concerned on a number of fronts. From the very beginning of this, we did a webinar with Ed Stetzer about how the church could respond to COVID. And one of the conversations had to do with, you know, the state, you know, rarely misses an opportunity to, to, to gain control. Mm -hmm. And look, that is just, 
from the beginning, the, the, the tendency of the state <laughs> post Eden, it just happens. And we should always be alarmed by that. So you think, for example, of certain things that Mayor de Blasio said in New York or, you know, the, TSA the, three, two, TSA, one. <laughs> comes to us. I wasn't going to actually talk about TSA, but I could. Oh, oh no. Um, what have I done? But, but, but look, it, the, the state does have a tendency to do that. And we have seen that in, in, in COVID. At the same time, there's also a history of theological reflection in ecclesiology. Now, it's, it's really clear, for example, that the, that the scriptures give very broad guidelines about the church being subject to authority. And good heavens, um, that was in a context where the state not only was trying to assert control over how public worship and, and whether it was actually carried out, but on private belief, like, do you believe Jesus is Lord or Caesar is Lord? And if you're not willing to say it out loud, you know, here's the death penalty. Uh, and, um, and yet at the same time, what does Peter say? What does Paul say? That the governing authorities are put in place by God. And, and, and theologians from Martin Luther uh, to the Puritan theologians and others have said, you know, look, there is a responsibility of the church uh, to obey the magistrate in this, in, 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 when it is in the sake of, you know, public health and safety and, and that sort of thing. And, and this, is, this is a long-established tradition. Um, and so look, I, I, am, I am spider sense wary of government growth and, and government control. Don't get me wrong on this. And, and yet at the same time, um, I have been very, very concerned uh, by church members letting this be the decision on whether they return to church or not. Hmm. Uh, letting, uh, you know, this, I mean, in, in terms of Paul's statement, become all things to all men, you know, in other words, this is you losing control to the state and not having faith if you think it is, but it's not otherwise. And, 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 and even it, and look, I'm, I will go ahead and publicly and put myself into the category of, I don't like masks. I don't wear masks when I don't have to. Um, I do it when I comply with the state. Uh, when I don't, then I don't. Um, I, I think it's overblown. I, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, and yet, is this the reason I'm gonna leave a church? And, and I bring this up, maybe this wasn't even in the, the question that our, uh, uh, our friend here was asking, and I, and I want to respect that if this is not what he was saying. But we said a couple of weeks ago, Shane, that it's going to be way harder for the church to reopen than it was to close. Mm -hmm. And that has borne out to be true. I cannot tell you the number of pastors, the number of church members, the number of uh, church leaders that are either deacons or elders or whatever in their local bodies that are saying, look, we have people leaving the church over this. My first question is where else you're going to go because everyone is, you know, kind of following those restrictions. But, but listen, I might think my pastor's wrong on this. Am I going to leave the church over this? Is, is this the theological issue that we're making it out to be? No. Um, and, and of course, is it a matter of faith? I, you know, look, if it's a matter of faith, I would never go to the doctor. I would never get a surgery. I would never take, you know, medicine. And, but one of the things we know from a biblical worldview is that God in his grace has made humans really smart. And that has borne itself out in wonderful advances in technology and medicine. I'm not saying that this is a good advance in technology, you know, a face mask. I, I, I don't believe that actually. But at the same time, your allegiance to the church is vital. The church is not non-essential. We talked about that in terms of video services and the need to gather together. But, 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 but I, I think it also applies here. Uh, the, the, the church is not an option for Christians. And I mean being a part of a local body. Mm -hmm. And this, to me, is not a reason to leave the local body or to show allegiance. Yeah, express your opinion. Talk to your pastor. But you know what? Um, no one has done this before in our lifetime. We're all making this up, and we're trying to go forward. And many pastors, I think, rightly are saying, look, we want to get our people back together, and this is what it takes to get people back together. So wear a mask, you know? Yeah. And I can imagine we're going to get lots of hate mail, and I will go on again and say, I don't like masks. I don't, I don't actually think they do all that much. At the same time, this is not a issue to leave the church over. And I'm really concerned when I see our kind of the, the, the everyday Christian's fickle relationship to the church exposed by issues such as this. You might disagree with me, Shane, but that's, that's kind of where I land. As far as I can tell, John, with the, um, with the science on it, there is, there's strong proof that the um, you know, masks are going to help lower the transmission rate to a, um, to a degree that's actually going to uh, 
lessen the severity of the pandemic itself. But I guess my response would be not so much to go to Romans 13, um, or even the, although the importance of the church is the is the key point you made there, um, in addition to obedience to the civil authorities, but to another thing that Paul says where he writes that um, it, in as far as it depends on us, we should live at peace with all men. I don't. I just don't see what the big deal is. Uh, maybe maybe masks are more uncomfortable. Maybe I haven't tried the masks that everyone else is wearing, uh, or or they're just more uncomfortable than than I'm giving them credit for. Um, but I've been wearing a mask when I go around places and it, it just doesn't seem like that big of a deal to me. Like, is this the hill to die on? I wonder that. It seems like there are a lot better hills to die on politically speaking um, and religiously speaking than that is. And I also am worried when I see Christians um, speaking of this in terms, and it seems like this, um, this particular listener is recognizing that this isn't something that, that is a, uh, a mandate for us to disobey God's law in some way, right? It's not like we're in the situation that Peter and the disciples were in when they said that we have to obey God rather than men because the authorities in, in Jerusalem told them to stop preaching. But I just don't see what the, what the big deal is. Why can't we wear a mask? If, it's, if it even has the slightest chance of being helpful for our neighbors who are trying to avoid being sick um, and, and keep the hospital system from being loaded up with um, patients during a second spike, then you know, just, you know, just wear it live at peace with all men. Um, don't make a big deal out of this. And I recognize that there is a, there is a, a place where you need to make a big deal of things politically. If, if your government comes down with a law that says, well, you can't say this or you can't say that, then you want to start protesting when the small uh, infractions are made, not when the, or when the small restrictions are laid down, not when things have gotten to the point where now you cannot speak at all. But I right. just don't and see that's, what the big deal is. I mean, well, and that's, yeah. I think probably part of the context is when you do hear, you know, the lines from Mayor de Blasio, like, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, immediately shut down churches. And we see the inconsistency, for example, of what's expected when you gather for church, but not when you gather for a protest or yeah. even worse, a riot, right? I mean, well, and I have a pretty good I, governor. So maybe that's part of why I'm not. Yeah, that's true. You are in Florida. Yeah. That changes things, right? Right, but, right. But, but, you know, you have the governor of Illinois is basically saying up front, churches are going to be closed for a year. I mean, just really clearly anti-religious bias. And, and we know that there's a distrust between people of faith in the larger state. Um, and, uh, but I, I think your point that just because we do have to stand up to the state on many things, doesn't mean we have to stand up to the state on everything. everything. Right. Right. Well, that's good. That, that was a good conversation. Hopefully we've helped uh, shed a little bit of light on that particular issue, but like you, I'm sure we will get a lot of feedback on it. Um, <laughs> folks, that's all the time we've got for today. Be sure to visit breakpoint.org for links to all the stories and articles that John and I have mentioned today on the program. You'll also find an incredible collection of resources there for, for you to uh, access every single day where it's updated regularly and it'll help you to live and think Christianly. That's at breakpoint.org. For the Colson Center and for John Stone Street, I'm Shane Morris. We'll see you next time.